I want to do a quick video here and uh, title it, Are All Bibles the Same? I really feel like these days a lot of people are confused. They've been mistaught or misled. They're ill-informed. And they really not, or, you know, I guess on the other hand, they might not have thought about it very much. A lot of people just don't think about this issue of, you know, is the Bible that I'm using, is it actually the Word of God? Is there errors in it? Um, a lot of people in the area that I live in, the Bible, they accept it as true. You know, this must be the Word of God. But, you know, for a thinking person, when they pick up an NIV, an ESV, a New American Standard, and the list goes on and on, you know, eventually they're going to say, are all Bibles the same? Is there any differences between these Bibles? And I would argue that there is. Um, and not just argue, but I can prove that there is. And uh, maybe I'll do a series of videos here on this topic, you know, are all Bibles the same? Uh, just before Wednesday night Bible study here, I figured I'd make the most out of my time and make this short video. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stay in the book of 1 John, and I'm going to show you three different examples here from the English Standard Version. I don't know if you can see that or not. This isn't the most professional setup. But I'm going to show you three different examples from the book of 1 John and prove to you, you know, at minimum, all Bibles are not the same. A lot of people would have you to believe all Bibles are identical. There's no difference between them. It's all the Word of God. And they'll make fun of people who are Texas Receptus only or King James only. And, you know, what I want to prove in these videos is it's not necessarily positive arguments for the King James, although I will argue that. But I want to prove and show people that there is a difference. And so you must choose which one is the Word of God. Uh, both of these cannot be possibly the same. They're not even teaching the same thing. And a lot of times, you know, Bible teachers, uh, false prophets uh, like James White will teach people, you know, they're all the same. It's all the Word of God. The, there's no meaningful differences. But I, I would argue that there is meaningful differences. And in the book of 1 John alone, I'm going to show you three pretty much off you know, the top of my head that I literally put together before Bible study here that show that not only is the Trinity attacked and, and or different, and depending on the Bible version you use, the Incarnation is, and we have Calvinism, or otherwise known as you know predestination unto salvation or damnation, uh, that is creeping in, in in these modern Bible versions. So I'm, I'm going to use my ESV here, uh, big old, uh, pretty pretty book. I mean, I remember I lost one of these in Kansas City. Uh, I mean, it's I used to love this thing until I actually got knowledgeable on the subject. And, you know, a lot of people think that King James Bible believers are just a bunch of ignorant fools, but in reality, there's a reason that I came to side with the TR and the you know, translation based off the Texas Receptus, which is the King James. Okay, so the first three I'm going to show you. First, let's look at 1 John uh, chapter 5, verse 1. I'm going to read to you first out of the True Bible, the King James. And then second, I'll read to you from the English Standard Version. And, you know, just, just for the sake of argument, I'm just going to use the ESV today. I could use other ones. And no doubt, they, there would be varying differences between each one. But these, this just goes to show you, for any preacher, or pastor, or Bible teacher, anybody that tries to tell you really, oh, there's no difference between all those Bible versions. It's all basically the same. This, this is just one book of the Bible off the top of my head. I'm, I'm sure I could easily come up with a, about a dozen more just from the book of 1 John, which is not a very long book at all. And these are huge doctrines. This has to deal with salvation. This has to do with the nature of God. This has to do with the nature of Jesus Christ. And I would argue that every one of those really have to do with salvation. You know, if you don't believe that God is triune, do you really have the right God? If you don't believe that Jesus Christ is incarnate, uh, that he came in the flesh, as we'll see, you know, you, you have the spirit of Antichrist. And with Calvinism, obviously, I believe Calvinism teaches a different gospel. Um, if, if it's truly a five-point Calvinist, hardcore, you know, I think that there really is a gospel issue there, uh, mainly to deal with, you know, the issue of limited atonement. But first, let's look at 1 John 5, verse 1. I'm going to read first out of the King James. The King James says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus, Christ, Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. So it's just a simple verse saying, hey, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, then you're born of God. 
and everybody that's basically begot or saved, you're going to love saved people. That's as simple as this verse is teaching. Now listen to this out of the ESV. Uh, a lot of people have called it the elect standard version, and for good reason. Let's see Calvinism here and see if you can pick it up. Most people probably wouldn't. The ESV reads, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. The emphasis is mine, obviously, so you can see. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. And so in the ESV, we have a subtle change that affects doctrine. In the ESV, it says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. It's a past tense thing. And so Calvinism teaches regeneration precedes faith. Now, a lot of them shy away from this because it's an absolutely stupid doctrine. It's, very, it's nearly impossible to try to defend biblically. You know, you say, well, where would someone go to teach that someone is born again before they even believe on Jesus Christ as their Lord? Because that's what Calvinists teach. Calvinism teaches that someone is born again, brought to spiritual life, prior to ever believing in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Very strange and perverse. In fact, contrary to Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, and I'm not going to go there to read it right now, but it's actually contrary to John chapter 3, where I believe Jesus answers Nicodemus' question and tells him how to be born again. And so Calvinism actually teaches, and a lot of them do it in a very subtle way, because if you outright teach the doctrine, it's very abhorrent and very silly, and it just, you know, it's counter. It's like, what? So someone's saved, they're brought to spiritual life before they ever believe in Jesus, and this has led a lot of Calvinists to, you know, come up with all sorts of weird explanations for how regeneration precedes faith. But what we do know here is, definitively, these are different. Who would argue that believing, it says, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. That's a definitive statement. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are born of God. That's, that's true. If you believe on Jesus Christ, you're going to be born again. You are born of God. Now, the ESV, though, says, who, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And so you can see this Calvinistic regeneration preceding faith being jammed into the text here. Um, they, they are not teaching the same thing. And I can easily see a Calvinist coming to 1 John 5 verse 1 and arguing that regeneration precedes faith. In fact, I've seen Calvinists make that very argument, but you cannot make it from the King James. So all Bibles the same? Not here it isn't. Second one. This is a really disputed one, but let's at least go through it and show, hey, all Bibles aren't the same. 1 John 5, verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now, in the elect standard version, we see in verse 7, for there are three that testify. That's it. So in the King James, we have a direct testimony to the doctrine of the Trinity. And in fact, this is really the only scripture in the entire Bible in one verse that perfectly encapsulates, teaches, outright defines the doctrine of the Trinity. In fact, the doctrine of the Trinity is this, that there are three that bear record, there are three persons, God the Father, God the Son, or the Word, and God the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus Christ is called the Word in John chapter 1. And also in 1 John 5 here, which makes sense, the same author wrote both books. And so you have three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. That is the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, what do you have over here in 1 John 5, 7 from the elect standard version? Nothing. For there are three that testify. Now, I don't have the ability, nor do I want to in this short video, make an argument for why this verse should be in there. And a lot of people say there's very scant evidence for it. And actually, when you're looking at manuscript evidence, there is very little historic manuscript evidence for the reading that analyzes the King James. What you have to determine is, number one, has the church of God always been wrong on this verse? Have Christians for 2,000 years been wrong on this until modern scholars in, in the 1900s finally figured it out? I think that attacks the doctrine of preservation of God's word, number one. Number two... You know, does the Spirit of God testify within you that that is a true verse? And I think everybody knows that it is a true verse. And number three, there was historic evidence that the, the people were attacking this verse. People made comments, I think Jerome made a comment, that people who didn't agree with the doctrine of the Trinity in the early church 
uh, heretics, you know, they were excising this from the text. And so there's historic reason to know that this was excised and removed. Arianism almost took over the church in uh, probably the th- uh, fourth century around that time. And, you know, I read, a, I read a history book one time that said that the church woke up and almost found itself Arian. You know, it, it's, it's almost like, you know, hey, whoops, almost everybody's a heretic now. And so that doctrine was under attack in the early church. The Council of Nicaea, they had to, you know, argue and figure out, you know, what was true. And people will make a lot of arguments, well, they didn't use this verse or whatnot. My, my simple belief is this. I believe it is scripture. If you don't, well, that, that's your problem with God and his word, number one. But number two, can we at least agree that these are not the same? Can we at least agree that in the King James, we have an explicit teaching of the Trinity and in the elect substandard perversion and every other essentially you know, modern Bible version, this verse is not even there. And in this one, it doesn't even say why it isn't there. Uh, so clearly there is a difference. And the third one I want to show you is this one just really briefly, uh, just you know, proving the fact that there's a difference between modern Bible versions and the King James. 1 John chapter 4, I'm going to start here in verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the, in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Listen to what the ESV does with this verse. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 2 and 3, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is is from God. Listen to this. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is in the world already. Now what's interesting to me is you have a positive and a negative in the King James. Uh, you know, hey, you need to confess Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. If you don't confess Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, you have the spirit of Antichrist. But in the elect substandard perversion, what we see in it is actually, hey, if you believe Jesus Christ came in the flesh, you know, you're a Christian, you're saved, that's right. But if you don't confess Jesus, then you're not a Christian. Now, it's not saying the same thing. This is similar to Mark chapter 16 when a lot of people twist it and don't understand God's word either. You know, it's like Jesus told people they, they didn't know the power of God or the scriptures. They, you know, they were ignorant of, they basically wasn't saved. And, um, you know, the spiritual man can discern these things, and a non a carnal, natural man understands not the things of God. In Mark chapter 16, the Bible plainly teaches that whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved, but if you believe not, you won't be saved. Some people say, see, you've got to believe and be baptized to be saved. But you see... The stipulation is, if you don't believe, you won't be saved. You know, he who believes and goes to church will be saved. Well, are you saved by going to church? No, you're saved by believing. And the negative shows you that, right? And so in Mark 16, the negative is, hey, if you don't believe, you're going to hell. If you believe and you're baptized, yeah. So it's a positive statement that's not necessarily, you know, as definitive as until you get that negative clause. And so here we see the negative saying, hey, yeah, you need, to, you need to believe, basically. You need to believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, and if you don't believe he's come in the flesh, then you have the spirit of Antichrist. What happens in the ESV? Oh, yeah, you, you know, if you, if you believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, um, every, it says every spirit uh, that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that's from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And so the power is essentially stripped out of this verse in the elect substandard perversion, and basically teaches that Jesus Christ, you know, you can just believe in Jesus. And, you know, well, maybe, you know, you deny the incarnation, but you're still of God. It's really, as long as you believe in Jesus, then you're saved. And, you know, what, the, you know, if you believe that he came in the flesh, then you're saved too. It's, too. it's a positive statement, and then the power is sucked out of the negative statement, you see. And so I can understand how people would still say, you know, well, at least the positive statement's there. But can we at least admit, again, that there's a difference in verse 3. When, some, when the my Bible reads, in 1 John 4, 3, every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, where the ESV says every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Who in the world would say, that's the same thing, that's not the same thing. There's multiple words missing, changed, and with those omissions, 
you can have people bring in and teach heresy. You know, it's amazing to me, so many people these days, they claim to be expositors and teachers of God's Word, and every word matters, and they teach verse by verse, word by word, and it's so meticulous how I teach. And yet they have, they have adopted a bibliology, a, an understanding of God's Word, that is totally counter to what they profess and what they act like they're doing in the pulpit. You know, if every word of God matters, does not this matter? I think it does. I know it does, actually. Every word of God is, is inspired and has been preserved, and we need to discern and figure out where is it. Is it in the ESV? If so, just go ahead and, you know, excise 1 John 5, 7 from your King James. In fact, put your King James down. That thing's riddled with errors. This is only one book. This is only a few examples where I, I can definitively prove to you and show you that, that this King James Version is, is dramatically different. And not just on little things like the these and the thous, which, by the way, have an important purpose, but the King James is superior in doctrine all over the place, superior in the Trinity here. It, it's superior on salvation. It, it doesn't even leave room for that Calvinistic garbage. And it's superior on the incarnation of Jesus Christ, which that's what the early church uh, was dealing with, was Gnostics who denied Jesus Christ had come in the flesh. And so this is an attack, really, on the nature of Jesus and its attack on the doctrine of salvation. Who would argue that these are the same? A lot of preachers. A lot of preachers say, well, as long as everybody in the pew is reading the Bible, it doesn't really matter. It's a watering down of doctrine. It's a watering down of God's Word. And, you know, I submit to you it does matter what Bible you use. All Bibles are not the same. And there is a difference between Bible versions. And with that, I'll shut this thing down and get it ready. If you ever want to join us here, you're more than willing, uh, more than welcome to come here. Uh, it's right across from the post office in Big Stone Gap, and uh, you know we do Bible study Wednesdays at six. Uh, we won't have it next week, obviously on Christmas, and uh, church services at eleven right now, um, and six o'clock on Sunday. So, till next time, God bless.